Let's go ahead and kneel for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for your great, great love to us today. Thank you that we can be still and know that you're God and that you never change. We thank you for that amazing love that you showed toward each one of us in giving Jesus in our place. We thank you for that this morning. We pray for the Holy Spirit to guide us as we Look at Pilate today and his encounter with Jesus. Please send your Holy Spirit to help us to apply this to our own lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to look at Pilate this morning. He wasn't just a coward. He was also a theologian. Maybe the part about him being a theologian we may not understand at this point, but I think we all understand why we would call him a coward. So, we'll take a look at Pilate this morning. Go ahead, sweetie. Again, our statement from Desire of Ages, page 83. One that we just cannot forget. It would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones. As we thus dwell upon His great sacrifice for us, our confidence in Him will be more constant, our love will be quickened, are you trying to see, sweetie, if I have this memorized? <laughs> you know, I think you and I need to have a little chat later. <laughs> we shall be more deeply imbued with His Spirit. If we would be saved at last, we must learn the lesson of penitence and humiliation at the foot of the cross. All right, next slide, sweetie. Pontius Pilate. A little bit of background about this Roman governor. What we do know seems to be that Pilate was a soldier in the Roman machine. He became famous for his valor and was given opportunity to take a high position uh, as a reward for his valor on the uh, battlefield. Pilate chose to become the governor of Judea, knowing that if he succeeded in Judea, the next step could very well be Caesar's throne. If he succeeded. Judea folk in the first century was considered to be the worst possible place. It was the worst assignment, Errol that a person could go after because the Jews were so volatile. But, if Pilate succeeded in Judea, he could very well have become a Caesar. Next slide. The day that actually determined Pilate's destiny was a Friday morning. Uh, it was Passover, it was April, um, in Jerusalem in 31 AD. And on that particular morning, Pilate's future was determined. Desire of Ages, page 723, says, After condemning Jesus, the council of the Sanhedrin had come to Pilate to have the sentence confirmed and executed. But these Jewish officials would not enter the Roman judgment hall. You know, it, it means a whole lot more to me, and if you will forgive me for this this morning, but it was the council of the highest ranking members in the Seventh-day Adventist denomination that came to 
the head of the people in Judea of the greatest nation on the face of the earth. And they came to confirm and to have him execute the killing of Jesus. But these Adventist officials would not enter the Roman Judgment Hall. Fascinating, this statement. Why didn't the Adventist officials enter Pilate's Judgment Hall? Do you know why they didn't go in? Because they would have been contaminated. What did you say, Pat? They would be defiled. Why? What, what, was, why, what were they so concerned about at that time of year? Passover. Exactly. They weren't supposed to intermingle with the heathen, and so if they went into Pilate's judgment hall, they would somehow become defiled, ceremonially defiled, and thus prevented from taking part in the feast of the Passover. Now, folk, there's a great lesson in this, I think, for us today, is that sometimes we can get so wrapped up in our rituals, in doing certain things, but if our heart and our mind is corrupted, if, if we're defiling our mind by things that we're holding on to, what good is our ritual? It, it's meaningless. So you think about on that Friday morning, what did the Seventh-day Adventists do the day after they killed Christ? What did they do? Where did they go? They went to church. Jesus died. It was about 3 o'clock Friday afternoon, right? Where did the Seventh-day Adventists go after they killed Christ? They ran home to get ready for what? For the Sabbath. Now, folk, obviously the Sabbath is important. Obviously it is. But, if we're using that to, to think that that makes every, every immoral or filthy or despicable thing that we did through the week, that somehow Sabbath makes it okay, it doesn't. It doesn't make it okay. It just makes the guilt all the more worse. So we've got to be careful We've got to be careful with the things that we do that we know God wants us to do that we don't... The bad part about this, they didn't have guilt. No, they didn't, Nelly, because they thought they were doing God's service. And of course, John 16 says that there will come a time when people will kill you and think they're doing what God wants you to do. Absolutely. In their blindness, they did not see that murderous hatred had defiled their hearts. You know, sometimes, sometimes, because we're the final church, we're the final group of people in this world, we're Laodicea, we can get the idea that we're rich and increased with goods and that we don't need anything too. It says that the Adventists in the first century were blind. We have that same blindness, don't we, friends? It's okay. It's okay for us to acknowledge the fact that we are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. It's okay. Because when we see what we really are, then we'll look for help. And Christ will be there to help us. But we have to recognize what we are. When the Savior was brought into the judgment hall, Pilate looked upon him with no friendly eyes. The Roman governor had been called from his bedchamber in haste. He determined to do his work as quickly as possible. So Pilate was upset. John 18.28 says, They led Jesus from Caiaphas, to the hall of judgment, it was early. They themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. So there's the scene. The, the Adventists are thrilled because it's a festive time. 
Pilate's mad because he's been called from his bedchamber. The Adventists want to make sure that they get Christ killed and killed quickly so they can get back home and get ready for the Sabbath. So that's the scene. Pat? Absolutely, Pat. Pat's comment for the camera is, is that they were so interested in their laws that they had lost sight of the principle of love, which was the embodiment of all their laws. Absolutely. Absolutely. Next slide. This is one of my favorite statements. Desire of Ages, page 724. It says, Pilate looked at the men who had Jesus in charge and then his gaze rested searchingly on Jesus. He had had to deal with all kinds of criminals, but never before had a man bearing marks of such goodness and nobility been brought before him. On his face he saw no sign of guilt, no expression of fear, no boldness or defiance. He saw a man of calm and dignified bearing, whose countenance bore not the marks of a criminal, but the signature of heaven. Amen. You know, folks, only Jesus Christ, only Jesus Christ could make us like that. I want to be like that. Don't you? To be able to stand before anybody, no guilt, no fear, no boldness, no, not, not being defiant, but just calm, dignified, with the signature of heaven written on our face. That's, that's what I want. I, I want to be like that. But in order to be like that, we've got to go through the school of hard knocks. Because we're naturally not like that. We're natural, we don't have marks of goodness and nobility. We don't. But if we spend time, if we spend that thoughtful hour dwelling upon the life of Christ, especially the closing scenes, by beholding, we can become changed and be like that. I want to be like that. How about you? You want to be like that too, don't you? This is the greatest thing. To be like Christ. Next slide. John 18 verses 33 to 38 tells us the questioning that went on. Pilate said, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him. Are you saying that because you're convicted of my character or did others tell you? Now that's what Christ was asking. Sayest thou this thing of thyself or did others tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? So Jesus wanted to see where Pilate's heart was. And that's why he asked him the question, are you saying this from yourself? Are you saying it because you're convicted that there is something about me that's greater than normal human beings? Or are you saying that because the Jews told you? So Christ wanted to see if Pilate was responding to conviction that the Holy Spirit was impressing upon him. And then Pilate skirted the issue. He said, am I a Jew? Your own nation, the chief priests, have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said to him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born. For this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? Now, folk, by how we answer that question, by how we answer that question, 
it will have a great bearing on where we end up in this great controversy. What is truth? Is it... Okay. The Bible, John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Jesus in John 14 said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. We also know in Psalms 119 that all the law is truth. Thy commandments are truth. So, that's what truth is. That's what is eternal in this life. That is worth living for. That is worth dying for. Truth is not, when am I going to eat? Truth is not, um, you know, Publix or uh, First National Bank. That's not truth, folks. Those are things that are here today and gone tomorrow. Christ is truth. His Word is truth. His law is truth. That's worth living. That's worth dying for. Next slide. Okay, next slide. Pilate asked a great question, but was too busy to wait for an answer. Because as soon as he asked the question, he raced right back out into the judgment hall. Didn't take the time to listen for Christ to give an answer. A golden opportunity had just passed him by. It could have made all the difference if he had taken the time to listen. Desire of Ages, page 727, it says, Christ affirmed that His Word was in itself a key which would unlock the mystery to those who were prepared to receive it. It had a self-commending power. This was the secret of the spread of His kingdom of truth. He desired Pilate to understand that only by receiving and appropriating truth could His ruined nature be reconstructed. Folk, we have got to take the time. We have got to take the time to find out what is truth on a daily basis in the morning. Because by beholding, we become changed. And if we're not beholding Christ on a daily basis, then who is in control and who's running our lives? The Father of lies, working through our sinful nature. That's who's guiding our lives. And if, if we are allowing our nature with the Father of lies, working through that nature to carry out what we want, folk, we're going to be lost. We're going to be lost. We must. You know, the beautiful thing that I love about Christianity, about Seventh-day Adventism, it's not something mystical. It's not something otherworldly. It's very simple. It's very practical. Am I spending time with Jesus? Am I? Are you? If we're not then our carnal nature is ruling our lives. And we're heading, we're heading in the wrong direction. We must connect to the power source because we don't have power. We do not have power, folks. I don't have power. None of us have power. But we can connect ourselves to Christ and find power in connecting ourselves to Him by prayer, by reading, and learning about Him. There's power there. What's that, Nellie? A daily way of life. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Next slide. Another beautiful statement. Desire of Ages, page 726. This is what Jesus was like. Standing behind Pilate of you and all in the court, Christ heard the abuse, but to all the false charges against him, he answered not a word. His whole bearing gave evidence of conscious innocence. He stood unmoved by the fury of the waves that beat about him. It was as if the heavy surges of wrath, rising higher and higher like the waves of the boisterous ocean, broke about him but did not touch him. He stood silent, but his silence was eloquence. It was as a light shining from the inner to the outer man. There's times to speak, but there's also times to just be quiet. This can apply in our homes, our relationships, at work. There's times to speak. There's times to confront, but there's also times to be quiet. Don't have to defend ourselves. Next slide. Pilate's fatal mistake. When Pilate had called the chief priests and the rulers and the people, said unto them, You brought this man to me as one that perverteth the people. And behold, I, having examined him before you, have found no fault in this man touching those things whereof ye accuse him. No, nor yet Herod, for I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. What was Pilate's fatal mistake? What was his... Okay. Nellie said he didn't stand up for what he believed in. Okay, didn't have the courage of his convictions, and Arrow, you said he compromised. How did he compromise in this statement that he just made? What did he say? He said he was innocent, Reggie. Then he said he would chastise him. Okay, so Pilate said he's an innocent man. What is chastising? What does that mean? Flogged. That's the word I, that, that stands out, to flog. Now, what was involved in flogging? Okay. 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 It was a whip, a long whip. And at various parts along the whip, there were attached pieces of bone, if they glass. There were all kinds of sharp things that were attached to this whip. And the person would be set out like this, and a Roman soldier would take the whip and they would fling it. And the whip would go and it would wrap itself around the person's torso from his stomach up to his shoulders. And then the Roman soldier would pull it. Now folk, what that would do is, is it would basically make the person's upper torso ribbons. The blood would begin to flow. Many times, many times when people went through that, they would die from loss of blood. It was an absolutely brutal form of punishment. 
Now, why, why did Pilate, he knew Christ was innocent, why would he have Jesus go through such a brutal punishment? He was innocent. Why would he do that? Save face with who? With the people. Okay. With the, with the Jews. He figured, okay, I've told him that he's innocent, and I have said, okay, I will chastise him, but then I'm going to let him go. If I give the Jews, show them that I'm going to cause Christ some pain, that will satisfy them. And then they will be satisfied, and then I can let Christ go. But it didn't work that way, did it? The way the Adventists viewed that was, this man is weak. And he has shown us his weakness. And if we push him far enough and strong enough, we'll get exactly what we want. See, Pilate, Pilate didn't make a stand. Pilate didn't make a stand. He compromised. He played. He played with the Jews. And the Jews knew, we've got him now. We've got him now. Next slide, sweetie. Pilate knew his duty. He had declared Christ to be innocent. Pilate had to release Christ. He had to let him go. Pilate's fatal flaw was that he was a coward. He refused to do right. That destroyed him. Now, folk, you know, there, there's so many things going on in our world where we need to take a stand. Now, just in church, you know, we hear about, you know, let's start using the new international perversion. Folk, uh-uh, uh-uh. No new international perversion, no new, new this or no good news. Folk, there's one Bible. But see, we compromise, and then it's more difficult to stand up next time. Here's another one. You know, we've got people that sing and sway and celebrate. And we're told, oh, we need, to, we need to support the rock music and the drums and the, and the wild singing. and Folk, we have to make a stand. We have to make a stand and say, no, I'm not going to go along with this. You know, like Landon, you were saying, you know, you get people from other churches coming into an Adventist church and speaking from an Adventist pulpit. You know, folk, when, when will people stand up and say, I am not going to go along with this garbage anymore? When are we going to stand? You say, well, you know, when, when the Sunday law comes, I'm going to stand up then. Folk, when it comes... It will be too late to stand. Because we've made so many compromises that when a Sunday law comes and the pressure is great, we'll say, well, my, I've given in this far. I might as well just give in now. And folk, we're a lost soul. Why? Because of all the little compromises that we looked at and said, those are little. They're not a big deal. It's, it's not essential. Folk, it is essential. Why? Because what we're doing is, is we're making decisions in our mind to compromise. That's what we're doing. So what we need to do is to go back and say, I was wrong. I compromised. I'm not going to compromise again. You know, on these radio programs I've been on, I've been speaking about spiritual formation and where it came from and where it's leading God's professed people today. And people will argue and say, oh, but the ship is going through. 
Folk, apostasy, apostasy never goes through. It never goes through. It didn't go through in the first century. You know, when you look at the first century of the Christian era, the Seventh-day Adventists were constantly being told, you know, stay with the ship. No matter how bad it gets, it's still going to go through because this is, God's, this is God's ship. And you know, the people heard that in 55 A.D. and 60 A.D. and 65 A.D. and 69 A.D. And you know what happened in 69 A.D.? The Romans came and surrounded the ship. And you know what the Adventist leaders were telling the people in Jerusalem? Just stay with the ship. Stay with the ship. God's going to deliver it. And you know what? When the Romans came into the city and started burning down the temple and everything started to collapse and Seventh-day Adventists were dying on the steps of the temple there, you know what the leaders were still telling them? Stay with the ship. God's going to deliver us. You know what, folk? God didn't deliver them. Why? Because they weren't on the ship anymore. They were in apostasy. Absolute apostasy. Compromise. You know, we as a people today, we don't even know who the Antichrist is. We don't even know who the Antichrist is. Now, I know I mentioned this once, but I'm going to say it again. There's a great movement amongst God's professed people today, and it's on 3ABN, and it's in the highest echelons of Seventh-day Adventism, that the Antichrist today is the devil. Now, folk, that's what I call compromise. That's compromise. The Antichrist is not the devil. Now, you know, that's politically correct, isn't it? Did God call us to be politically correct? Did God call Elijah to be politically correct? Yes or no? Did God call John the Baptist to be politically correct? Yes or no? Did God call Ellen White to be politically correct? Yes or no? Has God called us to be politically correct? No. God has called us to be a people who will stand for something that will not compromise when our soul salvation and other soul salvation are at stake. Next slide. Desire of Ages, 728. By this course, Pilate thought he sent Jesus to Herod when he heard that Jesus was from Galilee. He thought that'd be a good opportunity to heal an old quarrel between himself and Herod. And so it proved the two magistrates made friends over the trial of the Savior. Folk, we need to be careful with this too. Because we look and we say, oh, you know, maybe if, you know, I I might be able to get some friends if I you know, compromise a little bit because then people won't feel uncomfortable because of some stands I'm taking. Folks, that's what Pilate thought. Pilate said, I can can have friends. Herod will become my buddy if I just send Jesus to him. Yeah, they made friends that day. They became buddies, bosom pals. But they did it And by so doing, they sacrificed an innocent man. That's what they did, friends. So we've got to be very careful. Folk, it does not matter if it's, you know, our best friend from 30 years, um, somebody in our family. It doesn't matter. Right is right. Wrong is wrong. And we've got to make a stand. We can't compromise. If we do, we're playing Pilate. We're playing Pilate. Luke 23, 7 says, As soon as he knew that he belonged unto Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at that time. Wanted to become friends. Wanted friends. 
It didn't matter if an innocent man was killed. Just as long as they had those friends. That's all that mattered. That's what Pilate did. That was his reasoning. We make the same one as, as well. I, I listen. I have people that call me across this country that are still within the Seventh-day Adventist organization. And folk, that is their decision. That's their decision. And I don't tell them you better, you know, come out of her, my people. I don't tell them that. What I do is I say, make a stand. Do not compromise. Don't compromise. If you've got a Baptist in your pulpit, stand up and say, you get out of here. This is an Adventist church. Make a stand. Make a stand. Pilate destroyed himself, destroyed himself, because he would not take a stand. Next slide, sweetie. So Pilate refused conviction, scourged or flogged Christ. Christ is bleeding. His upper torso is shredded. He sends Jesus to Herod to try to make a friend. And in spite of all of that, Christ still tried to help. Still tried to help Pilate. He didn't give up on him. He kept working with Pilate. And Christ, we know in Desire of Ages, was praying. He was praying for Pilate. It says, Pilate was not left to act blindly. A message from God warned him from the deed he was about to commit. In answer to Christ's prayer. See, while Pilate was ripping Christ to shreds, Jesus was praying for him. Now, what an example that is. What an example, Pat Evans. Just like what you were saying in the sharing time this morning. I need, I need to not only keep my eyes on Christ, but I need to be praying for people like Doug Batchelor, for Ivor Myers. That's what I need to be doing is say, Lord, help those men because they've got to stand up for what's right. We've got to be praying for those that are causing us pain. The wife of Pilate had been visited by an angel from heaven, and in a dream she had beheld the Savior and conversed with him. Pilate's wife was not a Jew, but as she looked upon Jesus in her dream, she had no doubt of his character or mission. She knew him to be the Prince of God. She saw him on trial in the judgment hall. She saw the hands tightly bound. It's the hands of a criminal. She saw Herod and his soldiers doing their dreadful work. She heard the priests and rulers filled with envy and malice, madly accusing. She heard the words, we have a law and by our law he ought to die. She saw Pilate give Jesus to the scourging after he had declared, I find no fault in him. She heard the condemnation pronounced by Pilate, saw him give Christ up to his murderers. She saw the cross uplifted on Calvary. She saw the earth wrapped in darkness, heard the mysterious cry, it's finished. Still another scene met her gaze. She saw Christ seated upon the great white cloud while the earth reeled in space and his murderers fled from the presence of his glory. The cry of horror she awoke and at once wrote to Pilate words of warning, have thou nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. Do you think Pilate didn't trust or believe that his wife had actually had that dream? He did, didn't he? He knew she wasn't fooling. She said, have nothing to do with this man. Set him free. Why, why couldn't Pilate set him free? Why couldn't he? He had gone too far. 
he had gone too far. Folk, that is the danger. That is the danger of compromise. It's the danger of compromise. Take a stand today. Say, I've compromised on this. I've compromised with this individual. I've compromised at work over this. Folk, take a stand. We've all got to take a stand and say, this is where I'm going to stand. And I'm not going to compromise. And by God's grace, we need to stand there. Next slide, sweetie. So what does Pilate do then? He figures out a, a possible ploy to set Jesus free. There was a custom, a custom. The governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would, and they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. When they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? Now, folk, Barabbas. The Bible says he was a notable prisoner. Desire of Ages says that he was a killer. He was a thief. And he was trying to overthrow the Romans. This man was, he was raunchy. He was bad news. So he thought that when they brought the two of them side by side, that the Jews would say, oh, well, give us Jesus. Because Pilate knew that for envy they had delivered him. When he was set down on the judgment seat, okay, we know about the letter. The chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, Whither of the twain will ye that I release unto you? And the Sabbath keeping, tithe paying, Vegan vegetarians said, we want Barabbas. We want Barabbas. You know, folk, when I see that, all I can say is, is God, save me. Save me from myself. Save me from myself. Yeah, it does, Errol. It says his wife sent unto him saying, so it gives every impression that the letter was sent. He read it right then and there. Right then and there. I have nothing to do with this just man for I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. Absolutely, Pat. He was trying to, but he was using all of those attempts to excuse taking a stand. And then Pilate said to them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. Here's the theologian folk again. Pilate asked a question here that you and I all must answer. And by how we answer this question, we will determine where we will stand. Whether we will go to heaven or whether we will die when Christ comes. What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? What will we do with Jesus today? Will we surrender to Him Will we give him our lives? Or will we play? Will we play? Next slide. How would you answer the question from that heathen governor? What would you do? What are we doing with Christ today? Does he get in our way of our ambitions? Does he keep us from some cherished friends that we can't live without? 
What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called the Christ? Next slide. Pilate was strangling himself. He had scourged an innocent man. His wife told him to have nothing to do with Jesus. He figured the custom of releasing a prisoner would work, but it failed. He tried every compromising way, but would not do the right thing and let the chips fall as they would. He knew if he crossed the Adventist, he could lose his job. He was at a crossroads. The Jews put the nail in the coffin. They said, if you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. That was the nail in the coffin. That was it. Pilate wanted that job so bad. He wanted that prestige and power so bad. He would kill an innocent man. Next slide. Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. And now the theologian speaks one last time, and he tells us the one hope, the one hope that you and I have to enable us to live above the carnal nature that we all possess, to be able to live a life of peace with God, Pilate the theologian has spoken and given us the answer. He said, Behold the man. By beholding the man, we become changed. Will we heed the words of Pilate and behold the man? Or will we snub him because he keeps us from a job, a person, or a goal? Let us crown him. Let us crown Jesus Christ today as the king of our lives for now, today, and for eternity. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for this story today about a man who is like all of us, compromising, cowardly, trying to figure out every way we can to skirt something instead of standing up and meeting it. Please forgive us, Father, for all the things that we have seen in this man this morning that we don't like because they remind us of what we are. But thank you today that though Pilate's Pilate's history is closed. It's a closed book. We still have some chapters left. Thank you that we can make decisions this morning to make a stand on issues, on things that we have compromised on in the past. I pray, Father, with thanksgiving that your strength can enable us to be the men and women that you would have us be. I just pray that you'd bless each one of us today to claim your strength in our lives to take those stands that we need to take. In Jesus' name, amen.